For now, let's hear this week's message. Well, good morning. Well, well, thank you for welcoming me back. Yes, and welcome to everybody who's joining us on site and those who are online with us this morning as well. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, Nadine and I have been away for uh, about a week and a half, almost two weeks we were away. We went down to uh, Florida and down to the Caribbean for a little bit. Uh, people are asking, uh, how was it? Was it a good trip? Uh, it was minus 40 back here, so, and we were in the Caribbean, so it was fantastic. Uh, but even though it was wonderful down there, and we had this 70-degree difference when we came back that we had to adjust to in that one day, we were ready to come back home. Uh, you know, because reality is that, that we love, we love coming home. We love our home, we, we love our jobs, we, we love this church, and to be completely honest with you, I was really looking forward to this sermon series. To, to leading us all through the balance of the weeks that we have in this sermon series. And so, uh, so I'm glad to be back and uh, to jump into things here on week three of this series. We're calling this James, faith that works. And I love that phrase, don't we? Isn't that what we want? You know, we, we, just, we just want things to work. Isn't that true? The things that we have, the, the relationships we have, the people we trust in, the, the faith that we may cling to, we just want it to work, if we're, if we're perfectly honest, Right? Like when it was cold a week, week and a half ago, you plugged your car in at night, right? Because you trusted that your block heater would work so you could get to work. You just wanted it to work because you knew that if it didn't, you'd wake up the next day and you'd be rather frustrated because it didn't work. And you would think, well, this thing's unreliable. I maybe need to make a change in my, in, in my pattern, a change in the equipment that I'm trying to use. Have you ever had one of those remote controls for your stereo system, like one of the ones that is paired with your TV and with your receiver. And so you got one power button that just turns the whole thing on. You ever had one of those? Have you ever had a situation where you, you hit the power button, but it turns the power on for the TV, but it turns off the power for the receiver? And then you hit it again, and it turns off the TV and turns on the receiver. And then you hit it again, it turns on the TV and off the receiver, and then on the receiver and off the TV. It goes back and forth, and you keep hitting that thing going, I just want it to work. Right? Those, those kids, those kids must have been fooling with this thing, right? And then what do we decide, guys? We decide this, this is the reason I needed to get a whole new system because my remote control doesn't work. So I need a new TV and I need a new receiver, I need new speakers, I need new surround sound because my controller doesn't work, right? Now, now we laugh a little bit because we would throw out the whole system because the remote control doesn't work. But I want you to know as we go through this series, sometimes that's actually how we treat our faith. Sometimes that's how we treat our faith is that we program a part of our beliefs a certain way that doesn't quite work, or we use a part of it a certain way that doesn't quite work the way we want it to, and we get frustrated. We go, well, this doesn't work. This is unreliable. And so we throw the whole system away, and we go to try to find something new, or we realize maybe there is nothing. You see, whatever we possess, items, relationships, beliefs, we just want them to work. We want them to make a positive impact in our life. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? We just want them to work. Man, like, this is part of the beauty of the book of James. Because James in his book here, he calls us to not settle for a private, a, a comfortable, and idealistic knowledge of God only. James in his writings, he, he provides us this direction. He provides these practical instructions on living out your faith in a way that he claims works. Now last week we saw this, last two weeks, didn't we? We talked about real-life practical stuff. As Pastor Andrew led us through a discussion on what does it look like to endure trials. I know we all have trials in our lives. If you're not in one right now, I'm sorry to tell you, but you probably got one coming up. We've all got trials we need to endure. Pastor Andrew talked about how do we overcome temptation. I can pretty much guarantee you some sort of temptation of some level of some style is going to be coming your way today. This is real-life practical stuff. And the words that we read in James help us know how to navigate these things. It's the real life practical stuff that is required to endure with our faith in God. And so today we're going to jump back in. We're going to jump into chapter 2. If you want to follow along in your pew Bibles, it's found on page 978. Or, of course, the pew portal is always there. You can scan that. You get all your sermon notes right there for you. But in James chapter 2, we're going to add another topic here today. A topic that is probably close to the heart of anyone. If you, if you were ever picked last for dodgeball, if, if you never got asked to go to prom, if you are in your 20s and going to university, but you still end up getting sat at the kids' table, this is a passage that's going to relate to you. 
Or if you have a heart for those people, this passage is going to speak to you. But, but more seriously, on, on that note, this passage today talks about a sin that God takes very seriously. It talks about a sin God takes seriously because it's one that has the power to negatively impact our relationships with our brothers and sisters, but also it has the power to impact the witness of God that we reveal to the world all around us. But when we can live in a freedom of this sin, you know what we'll experience? You know what we're going to experience? A faith that works. We'll experience a faith that works. Here's what James says, James 2, verse 1. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Some of your versions may say partiality. Favoritism, partiality. This is the idea, <coughs> excuse me, this is the idea that somebody is more valuable, more important, that somebody has more worth than another person. And the way that we arrive at these conclusions is quite often we, we, we draw these distinctions based upon, well, who has more power? Who has more wealth? Who has more influence? Who, who has more beauty? Who, who has more fame? And, and you don't have to live in the world long enough to know that this is a real life thing. Isn't it? This is real life practical stuff. We don't have to live in the world long enough to know that this exists. When, when we see kids get together, even, even, even at the daycare, I watch the daycare kids sometimes. There's a pecking order, even in daycare, that happens. You send your kids to school. We know one of the timeless challenges of bringing kids to school is bullying. We know when we go on a sports team, who gets to play on the first line? Who gets the most minutes on the ice? I used to coach hockey. That was a huge issue. My kid's not getting enough time on the ice. These other kids get more time on the ice. Why are you being favorites? Why are you showing favoritism? It happens in politics. It happens in business. It's, it's the reason we have celebrities in the society around us. And we can see the impact this has upon society. Consider, for example, I, I came across this, um, this example of Nike, uh, one of the biggest companies in the world, who is known for doing massive endorsements with sports athletes. Now, now the biggest one they've ever done was with Michael Jordan. Okay? Michael Jordan. Basketball player, arguably one of the best, if not the best, basketball player ever. Played for the Bulls, had those Air Jordans. That's why we have Nike Air shoes, those Air Jordan shoes still around. Well, at the peak of his career, Nike was paying him more in endorsements than every other Malaysian worker making the shoes combined. There was a distinction there. He made more in endorsements than the combined salary of all of the Malaysian workers making the shoes he was endorsing. Now, I, I like Mike, okay? And I know Mike has done some extremely good charitable humanitarian work in his city and around the world. Uh, but, but I use this example of partiality to show that, that isn't it true? There's just something out of balance in society. Isn't that true? There's just something out of balance in that. And even in some of our churches, even with the, the, with the people of God, we're not immune to this. And so... The church that James is writing, the churches that James are writing to are not immune to this either. And they were prone to judging others based upon what a person possessed and what they didn't possess. And, and based upon the, the potential impact, you know, positive or negative, that cozying up to that person may just provide for me. And, and James gives an example of this as we, as we continue reading here in verse 2, in chapter 2. He gives an example of this. He says, suppose a man comes into your meetings wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and then a poor man in filthy clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and you say, here is a good seat for you, but to the poor man you say, you, you stand over there, or you sit at my, at, on the floor at my feet, have you not discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? You can visualize the scene. It, it, it's pretty... It's pretty clear to visualize this scene. As people are gathered for a church on an average Sunday morning. And a wealthy man walks in, walks in one door. And all attention goes to ensuring that he has the best seat. That, 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 that he has special attention and service. That his needs are met. But then another man walks in a different door, a poor man. And as he sees what's happening over there, he, he walks in and, and he's kind of made to feel like he should just be happy to be there. No concern is shown for his needs. He's, he's told that you can either stand against the wall at the back 
Or you can come sit at my feet with all the other lowly people. Now, and as we think about this contrast taking place within a church sanctuary, I, I, I'm going to guess a lot of us feel kind of uneasy about that. True? It's just an uneasy feeling. that like Something is off. If that's how we're relating, if that's how we're going to value people, something's off if we do this in the world, but, but how much more so if we do it within the church? And I would agree with you. I would agree with you that it's something's off. But, but here's the thing. We need to put our finger on why. Why is it off? Because it's, it's not just that we're being impolite. Well, it's just not socially proper to do that. No, that's not why. It's not because we're jealous going, well, I don't want to be the guy at the floor. I want to be the guy at the special seat. It's, it's, it's not about being polite. It's, it, it, it's not about feeling jealous. James tells us what the issue is. He says it, he says it in verse 4. He says, have you not discriminated against yourselves? Have you not become judges with evil thoughts? Have you not become judges with selfish motives? Basically, it's another way we could look at that. Because what, what do judges do? Judges are in a position where they make distinctions. They decide who is good and who is bad, who, who is innocent and, and who is guilty. They decide who goes free and who goes to prison. That's, that's what judges do. They make judgments. They make distinctions. How does a judge do that? A judge does this by aligning themselves with some sort of authoritative criteria. We, we know this in our, in our judicial system. Our judges are aligned with the laws and the acts of the land that, that govern the land, and they judge according to the laws and the acts that govern our land. But we also see this in culture. We see this in our society, where the majority opinion of the people will decide what is right, what is favorable, what is valuable. Now, James is not addressing the law of the land here. You know, for him and for us, the church is under and must abide by the laws of the land. That, that's, that's not the issue he's drawing here by saying you, you, the word judge. But he is addressing that cultural dynamic. He's calling these worldly, selfish motives evil thoughts, he calls them. But why? Why are they evil thoughts? Well, what are the reasons that you would want to give preferential treatment to somebody who is wealthy? What are are your motives if you want to give preferential treatment to somebody who has power or has beauty? Is it possible that the reason, the motivation behind doing that might be an internal thought that goes, well, you know, who would I be more comfortable associating with? You know, who, who would be better for, for my reputation and, and by extension the reputation of the church if they were acknowledged more? It, it might be these, these thoughts or these motives of, of church leaders who say, man, that, that person could do so much good. They, they, could, they could provide so much for the church. They could provide so many new ministries that could be funded. They, they, they could maybe, maybe it might even advance my career a little bit. I got to tell you, I, I know this feeling. I, I was involved in a situation a number of years back where, where a, a wealthy person came into the church and made a $1 million donation. It wasn't in this church, different, different setting. A $1 million donation. But they attached a very specific use to it. They said it has to be used for this particular thing. And as we held that paper in our hand, I got to tell you, and I, and I think you would be in the same spot I was, when we held that million dollar check in our hands, we wanted it. We wanted him to be happy because we wanted it. I imagine you find yourself in the same situation. And just we're just thinking, think of the people we could reach. Think of the, uh, of the advancements, the updates we can make to our facility. Uh, think of the favor that we may have with people in the congregation. We would gain a lot of good favor if we could facilitate such projects and ministries and such reach into the community. But as we held that check, we knew there was a danger to it. We knew there was a danger to allowing a person to buy ministry. We knew there was a danger allowing a person to direct ministry with their money. We knew there was a danger allowing that sort of power to influence the direction that we are going as a church as opposed to the direction we felt God was leading us as a church. So as much as we wanted it, 
we had to ask for the conditions to be removed or we were going to refuse the donation. Now, as I share this story, it's not because it's a slight against those who are wealthy or, or a slight against those who are influential or, or a slight against those who are beautiful because if anybody here has a million dollars, let's, let's talk. <laughs> we can have the, I've, had, I've had them before. I know how to have those conversations. <laughs> no, it's, it's not a slight against those things. It's a warning. It's a warning not to place our trust in those things. It's a warning not to allow those to be the things that establish the authoritative criteria by which we judge other people. Does that make sense? That's the warning. That's the warning. But, but that's how it was. That's, that's how it worked in the Roman world in which James is writing into. And by a great extension, that's still how it works within our world. And it does seep into our churches. So, so in this Roman world in which James is writing, even more so than today. Even more so than today. People were divided into these specific social castes. And that had significance. You see, which social caste you fell into would determine, you know, what sort of social honor you had and what parts of the community you could associate with. What, what, what caste you were put into determined the access to the places you could go and the places you were not permitted to go. It made an influence upon your authority, your ability to enter into agreements and to, into, uh, uh, you know, you're standing even before a judge, your authority over others. All, all these things were affected by how society assigned you a social caste. And, and, and the church exists within this world in this particular time. But the church was like one of the only, if not the only place that opened the doors and said, all are welcome. And so you have so many different types of people all coming in, bringing the world in with them. And James speaks to some very real-life situations that they were experiencing in this context. But he points out just how foolish it is to allow these things to make their way into the church. And here's what he says, beginning in verse 5. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who loved him? But you have dishonored the poor. It's not the, is it not the rich who are the ones exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom, to whom we say we belong? This example that, that James talks about here is so different than the example and the message of Jesus. So different than, there's a huge distinction there. When we look at the Gospels, we have a Gospel of Luke, for example. Very early on, as Jesus is beginning his ministry, he walks into the synagogue in Nazareth. And he opens a scroll of Isaiah before all who are seated there. And what did he say to them? He said, I have been anointed to proclaim the good news to the poor. And then a little while later, as he, as he sat on the mount and gave the incredible sermon, the, the Sermon on the Mount, one of the very first words... He says in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of God. See, see, God shows no favoritism, but it seems clear that he chose intentionally to include and to honor the poor in his kingdom. And yet James's churches are experienced in a situation where the rich are using their wealth and their influence to exploit the poor. And then they all come together on a Sunday morning, and the rich are paid special attention while the, the poor are pretty much ignored, and then they're all asked to share a pew. And then he add to that the fact that the outside world is watching. They're watching. They're, they're wondering, what, what's, what's so unique and different about Jesus than, than what I've experienced at other, it's a very religious society. And what I've experienced at other temples and faiths that I've heard. But what's, what's so different about Jesus? As they watch this, they go, well, what, what, what is the message? What, what's, what's the message they're trying to have me hear? They're, they're looking inside, watching this, and they're saying, what makes this place so different than every other place I go to in the world? It, and if those answers are, if those questions are answered, if they're defined if, uh, by the view of how that particular church was treating the wealthy versus the poor, people would look in the door and then they'd go, 
Yeah, looks the same to me as what I experience everywhere else in the world. But see, the church is called to have eyes to see those who the world does not see. It's called to have eyes to value those that the world may not value. And not as a form of, and be careful of this, it's not as a form of like, of like reverse favoritism, where all of a sudden being poor is the new status. That, that's, that's, that's one of the big issues with the social gospel, and people who, who fully commit to this, this idea of a social gospel, one of the biggest issues with it is they basically take the exact same issue they're against, but they just flip it on their head, where they start showing favoritism to the poor and discriminating against the rich. It, it's, it's still showing partiality. It doesn't solve this issue that James is addressing. You know what solves it? Is when we come to understand that the church is to be the one place in the world where we can all come together, where the old and the young, the rich and the poor, men and women can all come together, where they can bring the beautiful parts of their lives and they can bring the ugly parts of their lives, where we can all come together and where we will afflict the comfortable and we will comfort the afflicted. A place where we can all come together and we are all equal and we can all stand as one body, unified under one criteria. And you know what that criteria is? James already told us. He told us in verse 1. He told us in verse 1. That one criteria is when he said in verse 1, we are all believers. in who? In our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Believers in our Lord Jesus. That is the one criteria. When we are believers of the, of the one who created and sustained all of creation. The one who exists in perfect holiness and majesty. The one who, who dwells in so much glory that, that scripture describes it as this unapproachable light. That if we were to look at it, we would perish. And yet the one who looks at us and gave us breath. The breath of life. But then sent his son to give his life as an act of love that we may dwell in eternity with him. We're talking about the Lord of glory. The only distinction that should exist is not between man and man. The only distinction that should exist is between God and man. And when we acknowledge his presence, when we acknowledge his majesty, all of these, these things of the world, like worldly wealth, worldly power, what this world considers to be beautiful, when we consider the presence and the majesty of Christ, those things just like, they just like melt. They just melt away. And when we acknowledge that and we see it, all of a sudden we feel ourselves starting to become poor. But, but poor in spirit. D -d Seeking, desiring to become rich in him. And when that happens, it is from that posture that we then can all stand. No, no, no. It is from that posture that we then all can kneel on level ground before a glorious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? This is, this is something that God takes very seriously. And he wants us to take it seriously as well. Because it has the ability to not only powerfully impact for, negatively or positively, our relationship with him, but also as we're seeing, our relationship with others as well. So, so let's, let's press on and see what he has to say about that, about, about how serious God takes this sin. Starting in verse 8, James says, If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin, and you are convicted by the law as a lawbreaker. For whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said you should not commit adultery also said you should not commit murder. If you do not commit murder but you do commit adultery, you have become a lawbreaker. You've become a lawbreaker. Remember back in um, uh, Mark chapter 12. Remember back in Mark chapter 12. When Jesus was asked, what, what is the greatest command? Remember that passage? So there's been a few of the Gospels. Well, that actually wasn't really the first time that, command, that, that question's ever been asked. Like, this was actually a bit of a question of the day, a bit of a traditional question of the day. There's, there's also a, a, a famous Jewish story of a man who came to, to Rabbi Shammai and asked him a very similar question. Rabbi, teach me the whole Torah. Lord, teach me, Rabbi, teach me the whole law while I stand on one leg, is how that question used to be asked. And the rabbi responded by saying, well, what is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. That is the whole Torah. The rest of it is commentary. Now go learn it. 
So, so this already sort of existed. This idea existed in the time in which this question was asked. But this man comes to Jesus and asks him, what is the greatest commandment? A bit of a different version of the exact same question. And how did Jesus answer? Remember how he answered? In, in Mark chapter 12, we read this. Jesus said, the most important one is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. And the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. This came, kind of became known as like the golden rule, right? Here's referred to as like the royal law. And Jesus is said to have improved upon the rabbi's answer. Because, because remember, the rabbi's answer in, in Jewish tradition was basically do no harm. Don't, don't do anything mean to anybody. If, if you want to be mean to you, don't be mean to them. Just don't do any harm. But Jesus takes this step further and says, no, it's not enough to just do nothing. You need to actively do something. You need to actively be engaging and loving one another. And so we can see from this that the absence of love, or worse yet, the activity of partiality is a sin. It's contrary to the greatest command, to, to the commands that Jesus has given us. Now, as we consider this one, as we consider this sin of favoritism, this, this sin of partiality and how prominent it is in our society and, and the world that we live around us, there might be some people who are think, thinking to themselves, it's just a little sin. Like, does it really matter that much if I don't go talk to that person because you know, they're, they're just different than me? Does it really matter that much? Surely God's going to overlook that. Like, he's going to understand that, isn't he? Or you might think to yourself, yeah, I sin. But I do so much, this is so little, and I do so much other good stuff. Like, like, like we get the balances out, and God's going to get the balances out. And he's going to be like, man, like, okay, you're a good person. I, I, I get it. I know you did this, but you do so much other good. I, I get it. You're a good person. You ever play those games with yourself? You ever play those games where you get out the scales, and you, and you weigh the good, and you weigh the bad? And you go, well, there's, there's so much more good than bad. And, and not only in my own life, when I look at how much good and how much bad I have, like, but then I look at uh, that person over there, and I'm like, well, especially compared to them. But what do we just say? You ever play those games? But we just say a minute ago, what is the only distinction that matters? Is, is it a distinction of, of, of kind of these worldly ideas of which person is better or wealthier or power, more holy, more righteous than the other person? Is that the distinction that we said matters? No, we, we just said a minute ago, the only distinction that matters is between God and man. And when we understand that's the only distinction that matters, there, there, there is no ranking of more good than bad. Uh, for, from that distinction, basically what it means is you commit one sin one time, God looks at you and goes, you are a lawbreaker. Lawbreaker. And in that moment, you are worthy of God's condemnation. Romans 3.23 was to say, it says, for all have sinned, all have sinned, and all have fallen short of God's glory. All of us have sinned. All of us have done, we know we've done more than one thing. We've all sinned. No one can ever stand before God and be, come on, God, I'm a good person. That doesn't exist. The only distinction that matters, the only measurement that matters is are we holy enough for God? And if we don't understand that, we do not yet understand what it means to be poor in spirit. Because we're still trusting in ourselves as our own Savior. And so somehow we can earn our own salvation. Somehow, if we, if we don't understand that, we're still using worldly criteria to justify ourselves when we stand before the glorious Lord Jesus. There, there, there is no comparison. We cannot justify ourselves by that means. But verse 24 tells us, all are justified freely, not by ourselves. How are we justified? We are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came through him, not through ourselves. See, in the end, the only criteria that matters is do we believe, do we trust in the glorious Lord Jesus Christ in whom we find salvation, in whom we are brought into the family of God. So let me pull this together for us. This, this idea of this sin of favoritism, this, this sin of partiality, because it may seem like a small thing, but, but God takes it very seriously, and I think there's three reasons. I'll just recap for you three reasons he takes it seriously. First of all, it's this. 
Because favoritism shows a lack of faith in God. It shows a lack of faith in God. It shows that we are looking towards others to provide. We are looking towards others to define. We are looking towards others to establish our identity as opposed to looking to God. James calls this evil thoughts. He calls this selfish motives because it's a lack of trust in our glorious Lord Jesus. So the first thing that this sin is about is it's about a lack of faith in God. And secondly, it shows a lack of honor towards God and a lack of honor towards those who God has chosen to honor. Jesus came to give his life for all people, the rich and the poor of this world, that we may seek to become rich in him. It shows a lack of honor to God and to those that God has chosen to honor. And then thirdly, it shows a poor witness of Jesus Christ and his good news for all people. See, the church should not be striving to look and feel like a country club. I think we should look and feel like a hospital is what we should look like. A place where all people are welcome to come and to seek healing, to seek to be saved, to experience the great physician, Jesus Christ. So, whether we're talking here about a sin of partiality or, or any other sin, I just want to leave you with this thought. I want to leave you with this, that, this, that we would heed this challenge that James concludes his passage with. And here's what he says in the end. So we reflect upon these words for a moment. In verse 12, he says, Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. But mercy triumphs over judgment. We don't like this idea of judgment sometimes, but when we read the Bible... We know that there is a day coming when all people will be judged. We know that day is coming. And so James is saying here, live like that's today. Live like that day is today. Because let me ask you this, if it was today, if today was the day that you were going to be judged and stand before God, what difference would that make? How would your words, how would your actions, how would your attitudes be different if you knew you were going to stand before God today? Would you pass by those that the world considers poor? Would you have better eyes to see them and a heart to share your life with them? Would you start to take steps towards people who perhaps are a little hard, let's be honest, some people are hard to relate to, but would we be more motivated to take steps towards those people to get to know them? Would, would, would be more motivated to take steps towards those that we have hurt in the past, that we may be able to engage in forgiveness with them? If we knew today was that day, would we have a new view of ourselves? Would we, would we come to the point of saying, no matter how loved or more how valued or how important I may think I am or I think I am not, I am no more or less or no more valued love than anybody else. Because God does not show partiality. Here James says, Judgment without mercy. Judgment without these types of mercies will be shown to those who do not show mercy. And now, that's not meant to be a threat. That's meant to be a challenge. A challenge where he's asking you, do you understand the good news of Jesus Christ? Do you understand the mercy that you have been shown from God yourself? And if you do, you will become poor in spirit. And you will desire to show mercy to others. This is what power is. This is the beauty. This is what is valuable, the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The fact that God knows everything you've ever done. He knows everything that every person has ever done. All those things you wish you could do over again, God knows about them. The, the mistakes you've made, the hurt that you've caused to other people, the, the secret thoughts that you would rather just keep a secret. God knows them all. And it his response to you is not to judge you and not cast you aside as the world may do, but instead to move towards you, to send his son to give his life to die for those sins. And that is the good news, that even in spite of those things that we may have done, thought, and, and the injuries we may have caused, that, that God moved towards us to rescue us, to, to forgive us, to, to show us love, to show us mercy, that we could become called sons and daughters of the living God. And if we get that, if we understand that in our own lives, the very last thing we should be doing is judging others. We should have favoritism amongst others. Instead, we should be living a life that, 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 that just reflects the gospel in the world around us. 
moving towards those that we would not normally associate and that we know need Jesus Christ. So I ask you this. Who do you know? Who do you see in the world that the world may have cast aside that the church and the people of God could welcome in? Because we are called to be one under the Lord of glory, to not show favoritism. And we are called to invite others to the Lord of glory. So as I close, I just want to invite you all. Would you stand and would you join me in praising and remembering and honoring the Lord of glory, our Savior Jesus Christ.